Our sermon today will be taken from Psalm chapter 131. This is God's word. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Thus says the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let us pray one more time. Heavenly Father, more now more than ever, are we reminded that creation is cursed and is full of sin and this world is not our home. And more than ever, are we reminded to cling to you on your cross. I thank you, Lord, that not more than ever right now, we have technology and um, advancements in me medicine by your grace that we can deal with this uh, the most effectively as possible and that your people may be able to worship you more fully than ever in times like these. It is all because of your grace, Lord. And Father, as we come to meditate upon your word this morning, I pray, Lord, you can send your Holy Spirit to divert our anxieties, divert our minds from what's going on around us, that we may focus on you that we may look at your beauty, Lord, and that we may be refreshed, for you are our everlasting hope, and in the end, you will wipe away every tear. In this we hope, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. So from my own experience, and perhaps some of you here can relate with me, one of the most elusive and confusing things for me is this thing called contentment. For most of us, when we hear contentment, we probably think of some sort of feeling of happiness or satisfaction about our current situation. Like when we look around our lives and say, yeah, I'm good. Not that I've never experienced this, but I find that this feeling is always fleeting, meaning that it never seems to stick around here one day and gone the next. And I think one reason why some of us here probably experience this is that the world and culture that we live in is thoroughly consumeristic and materialistic, and that we're constantly being bombarded by messages from our culture and media that somehow we're not good enough. Right? Media tells us that our physical appearance is not good enough. More than any other generation in the history of the world, we are most exposed to unrealistic standards of beauty. So in order to be attractive, I need to have straight, white teeth, clear skin, I need to be tall, and a maximum of 10% body fat. Right? And the culture could say that our lifestyle isn't good enough, that we need to be married, that by, by age 30, we need to travel the world and have all of these amazing experiences or else we'll be missing out. Our lives will not be full. Right? This whole FOMO culture that we live in. And the society that we live in tells us that we're not successful enough. We need to go to a prestigious school. We need to have a career in business that is respected and looked up to by everyone. We need to make an income that affords at least a living space in a nice area, two cars, an international school education, and a, co and a foreign college education for all of our children. Right? It's the Indonesian dream. And though those things are not bad things to pursue in and of themselves, but getting all that, that's a tall order. And as long as I don't have them, the world is constantly telling me that I'm not good enough. And sometimes their message gets to me and I find myself anxiously trying to li live up to their expectations, to look a certain way, to own certain things, to have certain experiences and relationships, hoping that when I do finally have these, I'll be satisfied and content as the world promises. But I find that in this pursuit, I don't actually find contentment but I find myself in one of three places, either a place of anxiety or depression where I don't currently have what I think is necessary to be happy, and this feeling becomes much worse and turns into despair when I have to come into terms that I might never have this, or a place where I'm probably mostly at is a place where I'm simply tolerating my life, right? Well, it's not ideal, 
could be better, but it could be worse. Or it could be this place of ecstatic happiness, right? When I'm loving life, when I feel like I'm on top of the world, and this usually happens when I finally get what it is that I'm hoping for, or I'm getting closer. But this feeling does not last forever. And eventually, I find that I'm not actually fulfilled even though I do have what I want. So I move on to actually working towards achieving the next thing that might give me this feeling of gratification. Or I move on to actually working to keep this thing that once made me so happy because if not, I might lose it and somehow I'll be back to square one. So are we doomed to this, friends? Is this cycle of anxiety, tolerance, and ecstasy. A roller coaster ride of peak and valleys, enjoying the peaks while they last, because they're not gonna last forever, and they may be few and far between, while trying to keep our best, keep calm and carry on when we are in the valleys just now. But I think the Bible disagrees. And the passage that we'll be meditating on this morning teaches us how we can be free the cycle. So we'll be thinking about Psalm 131 this morning, and it is called a Psalm of Ascents. Right? Why is this important? Well, the majority of biblical scholars believe that the Psalms of Ascents are a collection of psalms that Israel would sing as they would make their way up to God's temple in Jerusalem in their three pilgrim festivals, right? And they're a song of ascents because Jerusalem is actually located on a pretty st steep hill. So the Israelites would have to climb this hill, ascend up this hill, in order to get there. Now, this could be a pretty dangerous task, as you can imagine. 2,000 years ago, there were no handrails or cable cars to help them get up there. And they'd be bringing valuables and their uh, livestock up there, so bandits could rob them, they could fall and die. So why would Israel go through the trouble of doing something like this? Well, it's because the destination and occasion is worth it. Right? They were going to God's temple, where God's presence actually was. They went so they can sacrifice, so they can have their sins forgiven. Right? So they would make their way from all over Israel to Jerusalem on this dangerous journey. And isn't this, friends, a picture of our lives? Right? We are on our way to God. Because when we die, we know we're going to meet our maker. But on this way, we see many dangers, toils, and snares. Right, the coronavirus being one of them. And we think, how are we going to make it? So the songs of ascent were sung by Israel to comfort them on this journey, to help them remember why they're on the journey at all. Likewise, it can comfort us on our journey as well. So particularly our psalm, Psalm 131, reveals the heart of David, who is able to be at rest with God even though he is on this dangerous trek. It is a poem who describes the posture of someone who is actually fully content in the Lord. The psalm teaches us that contentment has three features. These are three points. First, a humbled heart. Second, a quieted soul. And three, an everlasting hope. Humbled heart, quieted soul, and an everlasting hope. So point one, a humbled heart. So in verse 1 of the psalm, we see that the author, David, admits two things before the Lord. One, his heart is not lifted up, and two, his eyes are not raised too high. So to, so to understand this, I think we need to clarify what the Hebrew understanding of the heart is, right? So for us modern people, when we look at the heart, we might think of the actual organ, right? the center of our physical life. Someone is considered medically dead when their heart stops beating. Or we would think of the heart as the faculty of feeling, the center of our emotional life. So when something truly horrible happens to us, we say that we are heartbroken. The, the meaning for the Hebrew word for heart, lev, communicates more than this. Right? Yes, it is used as the center of our physical life. Yes, it is also the center of our emotional life. But it is also the faculty of thought, right? what we think with in the Bible. And it is also the faculty of our will, how we make our choices. So David here is saying that everything within him, his physical life, his emotional life, his thought life, his will, is not raised higher than it should be. In other words, David is admitting to God that he is not God. He is creature and that God is God. 
This, and this is what also is being said when David is saying that he, his eyes are not lifted up too high, right? It is humble submission to God. He is not on eye level with God. He knows his place, right? He is not God's equal. David here is checking his ego. And it is more striking when we think of the fact that this is David here who is speaking now. Who is David? The most honored king of Israel. Right, the leader of God's people, the guy who God himself called the man after his own heart. If anyone's ego can be inflated, it should be David's. But David, as we should, realizes that nobody, not even him, has the right to do this before God. So this is the first part of being content with God, right? It's this awareness, admission, acceptance that we are creatures and not God, that he is in control, not us. His will be done, not ours. He defines what is good and evil, not us. He gets to tell us what to do. He is greater, more powerful, more knowledgeable, more glorious than we can ever begin to imagine. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. We exist for him and not him for us. He deserves all our praise, all our loyalty, all our obedience, because everything in heaven and earth and in all of creation exists. For the glory of God. And because David understands this, his response, his response to this is the second part of verse 1. He does not occupy himself with things too great and too marvelous for him. Because David knows that God is infinitely higher than him. That God is the one who is ultimately in control. In other words, because David knows his place, David knows that it's pointless to try and be God. Because friends, it is this activity, right? trying to be God, is what led Adam and Eve to first disobey God in the garden. To believe in what is, their own, what is right in their own eyes instead of what the Creator revealed to them. It is this activity of trying to be God that led humanity to fall into sin. That this world becomes cursed and the human heart is corrupted. Right? And it is this activity that causes us the anxiety and the suffering that we have in our lives. And haven't we all tried to do this at some point? For example, we try to do God's job by defining what is good and bad for ourselves. Right? This is what modern culture tell, tells us. That we have the right to define what is good and bad, moral or immoral, right or wrong. Nobody can know what is right for us except for us. We have the right to do what we want to do, live how we want to live, say what we want to say. I get to decide who I am. I get to decide what the world is. I get to decide how to live in it. I need to live my truth. Or we might even subconsciously be trying to do God's job by trying to be the author of our lives. We work so hard to gain money and power to make sure that we have control over our lives, that we get to do what we want to do have what we want to have, feel how we want to feel, be what we want to be, and be with who we want to be. Because deep down, we believe that it's on us to make it happen. That if it, if it is to be, it is up to me. And when humans have done this, disastrous things have happened. We don't always agree on what is right and wrong, and if this, the disagreement is bad enough, it leads to conflict maybe even violence. And when we realize that when we try to be in control of our lives, life will eventually make us realize that we are not in control and that we are thoroughly unqualified of, being this job, of doing this job of being God. We don't know enough, we can't do enough, we don't have enough to ensure that our lives goes according to plan. Or even if the plan was the right plan all along. And in the middle of this pandemic, isn't this felt ever so clearly? We are not in control. We are at the mercy of God. So, we always struggle to find contentment in our lives because we try to do God's job. So instead, we consistently find fear and anxiety. And eventually that can lead to depression and despair. Right? Because if we are in control and not God, it is really on us to ensure that we're happy, to ensure that we're secure and successful, to ensure that we're comfortable and that our family is safe and secure. And, we f and when we finally realize that we're incapable of doing this, right, either 
we try to convince ourselves that it's not as bad as we think or, and try to distract ourselves somehow so we actually work even harder, right? Or think about something else, hoping and expecting that things will get better if I work harder while somehow trying to silence the fear that we have deep inside of us of ultimately failing again and never getting better or messing up so badly that you can't return. Or we just give up on being happy entirely. And we settle on the fact that we'll never in any true and meaningful and lasting way be happy. That is called despair. Brothers and sisters, only God can do his job. Things will fall apart when we try because heavy is the head that wears the crown. So the first feature of contentment with God is when you lay your crown down upon the throne of the Lamb and let Him be God. So then, having come to terms with this, that He is not God, how does David apply this truth? Right, so point two, a calm soul. Because David is aware of his limitations and he's willing to cede control over his life to God, since David is letting God take care of the things that he cannot control, in verse 2, we see that David, what David does after doing this, right? He quiets his soul. In Hebrew, the word translated as soul, nefesh, is where we get the bahasa word nafas from, right? And it similarly, literally means throat or some kind of breathing organ, right? So you know how when you're really nervous and your heart is racing, we try to breathe really fast and we're gasping for air. <gasps> the best thing you can do is to calm yourself and take long, deep, quiet breath right, in your nose and out your mouth. Right? And this is the image that David is trying to give us. Right? So this is a double entendre, a poetic device that cleverly forms one sentence that can be read two different ways because nefesh does not only mean breath, but it also refers to your entire being. You see, I have a problem with the translation of the word, the soul, though I can't really propose an alternative, right? Because in English, the soul is, or the concept of the soul is this immaterial, eternal part of you that's somehow separate from you, your physical body, right? And it's somehow more essential to you than what is physical. But the Hebrew understanding, right, there is no concept of separation between physical and non-physical in humanity. Rather, we as a whole are a soul. Biblically speaking, our physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, social needs are all needs of the soul. So the soul is who we are in our core, our deepest passions, the thing that we love the most. And maybe a helpful way for us to think about this is that your soul is your identity. So David is saying here, right, that instead of trying to retain control over his life by defining good and evil for himself, by trying to be the God of his own life and authoring his own destiny, he says that he is willing to put his life, the core of who he is, his deepest needs and loves, his identity, in the hands of God. He's going to let God take care of it. You see... Why we are tempted to take on the job of being God and concern ourselves with things that we cannot know and can never control is because humans naturally has trust issues with God. Right? When we first fell into sin, Adam believed what is right in his own eyes over and above what is revealed to us by God. Likewise, we naturally hesitate and resist trusting in and committing to things that we cannot fully make sense of. And in times like these, when things don't make sense, right? when we're forced to rely and trust on something else, we become uneasy and restless. And it is exactly this hesitation and restlessness within the soul towards God that David wants to calm and quiet. Right? And it's understandable for us to have these trust issues with God because we can naturally think of God like we can think of another person, but with superpowers, right? as someone who can suddenly change his mind about us who can fail us, who can leave us, disappoint us, may, maybe even lie to us and hurt us, as human beings are known to do. And this is because we have never met anyone like God, whose love is eternal, unconditional, and unchanging, who is all-powerful and all-knowing, 
Nothing escapes his sight. There is no human being, not our wives or husbands, not our closest friends, not our family, not even ourselves, deserves this kind of trust. Because eventually, either we will disappoint them or they will disappoint us. But friends, God is not like this. And we need to quiet our souls to approach him with the appropriate posture for who he is. So how? How do we quiet our soul? Well, we do this by letting God define our identity and living according to that identity. So in order to combat our natural restlessness to take back control, we need to be reminded of why we shouldn't be in control. Then we need to give God the controls so that we can see that it is good that he is the one in control. Right? So what does this practically look like? Essentially, what this involves is we need to preach, to be preached at, and to preach the gospel to ourselves. See, the gospel message that God has given to us in the Bible, the, ma the message that we're supposed to preach here at church, it has power, right? First Corinthians, that's the message of the cross is the wisdom and power of God for those who are being saved. Right? So we need to take grasp of that power. So once you've heard the gospel message, meditated upon it, internalized it, it should melt your heart. And through it, you'll be given the courage to let God take over, the wisdom to look at reality on the grounds of God's truth and not our own thoughts and speculations. And it is then, when we have internalized the gospel message, we will see his beauty. We will see his infinite love for us. Then, it will give us the power to live obediently for him in a way that worships him, in a way that leads us to joy and life. And the more we're able to do this, the more will our souls be calm, right? So we can start with the basics. Worship with your Christian brothers and sisters. Meditate upon his word. Calm and surrender to him your troubles in prayer. Calming your souls with these activities when we find ourselves trying to grasp that control back from God right, is the equivalent of taking those long, slow breaths in through, in through your nose and out your mouth. You're anxious. You're gasping. So what happens when we do this? The image of David's soul, once it's been calmed, is like a weaned child with his mother, right? In verse 2b says, the image of the David provides is here of a baby who's been nursed and is resting on his mother's back as she goes about her work, not crying or throwing a fuss, not trying to get away, but fully secured and satisfied, but at the same time being completely dependent on his mother. Uh, I often see uh, driving the streets of Jakarta, right, um, children without helmets on the back of motorbikes clinging to their parents. Now, that is a thoroughly dangerous and irresponsible thing to do. But if you see the child, he ain't worried, right, because he has mom, and mom is not going to let anything happen to him. Right? And this is the image of trust that David here is giving us in a contextualized Jakartan way. Because you see, when we truly have given God control over our lives, when we truly have meditated upon the gospel and internalized it, when the gospel melts our hearts, it produces a childlike faith that clings firmly to your heavenly Father. Not a blind faith, because we clearly understand why we put our trust in God. And it's not being naive, despite evidence otherwise, because we see and we know how God has been faithful to us, but it is complete and utter dependence on him. It is deferring to him and following him no matter where he leads us and expecting that he will make good on his promises. The Apostle Paul is a magnificent example of this. A person who was beaten, imprisoned, bitten by a snake, yet is able to say that all things work together 
for the good of those who love God. Someone who has a genuine ability, right, to, cons- to say that he considers all things lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. And that even though things are seemingly falling apart, it stands true that nothing in heaven on earth nor anything in creation could ever separate us from the love of God. You see, Paul locates his soul, his purpose, his deepest needs and loves in Christ. Because of that, even though by the metrics of the world, he is lacking in much, but he lives his life with his soul satisfied and rested, truly content and totally worshipful in his life. It's like what St. Augustine famously said, you awakened us so that praising you may bring us joy because you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is always going to be restless until it rests in you. So apply your humbled heart to the resting of your soul. But why does this work? Why does admitting to God our limitations and inadequacies and giving control to Him bring us contentment? Verse 3 teaches us that it is because in the Lord we have an everlasting hope. Point three, an everlasting hope. In light of the fact that David has found rest for his soul, then David invites the rest of God's people to find this rest too by hoping in God from this time forth and forevermore. Remember why they were on this journey and they would be saying the psalm, right? On this dangerous and difficult pilgrimage up this mountain to Jerusalem where they can go sacrifice and have their sins forgiven. You see, why Israel was so anxious to make it up this mountain is because they do not have peace with God. They needed to be up there so that they can sacrifice and that their sins can be forgiven, right? They were looking, above all, for God's mercy and favor because Israel understood That if God did not forgive their sins, they would be God's enemies. And whatever earthly possessions, powers, relationships cannot help them solve this problem. Because what was coming for them was God's wrath. And this is ultimately our problem, brothers and sisters. Not only are we creatures, but we are disobedient creatures who has rebelled against a holy God. We've lifted our up our hearts high. We challenge his authority. We made ourselves enemies of God. And what we need above all is forgiveness. But as for us, we don't have to climb up a mountain to some temple to make sacrifices for our sins to be forgiven. Because God came down to us, became like us, so that he can be our sacrifice. Jesus is God taking on the form of man to be the sacrifice. You see, David and Israel's hope is that God would be faithful to his promise to forgive sins after sacrificing. Our hope is in Jesus, who lived a perfect and sinless life and took on God's judgment for us on the cross as the lamb, as our sacrifice. And the sacrifice of Jesus was made once and is good for all time And because of this, we forever have peace with God and he will eventually take us home so that we can enjoy this peace in full forever. You see, brothers and sisters, since we are no longer enemies of God of the universe, but we are now adopted as his children, it means the one who is in charge is on your side. The forces of the world, though they be... uniting and forming against you, we can say and genuinely proclaim that the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man, what can your boss, what can your enemies, what can the coronavirus do to me? So friends, brothers and sisters, we are not doomed to the cycle of anxiety, tolerance, and ecstasy because we can have a childlike peace with God. If we sit down, be humble, and realize that we are limited creatures in desperate need of grace, we will find that this grace is freely given to those who ask it of him. 
and humility. And by this grace alone, will we be able to let go of our lives, let him take control, instead, and rest our identity in him. And it is there we find the contentment that we seek. It is there that we can truly say, I'm good because the one who is leading me is perfect. And he has personally guaranteed that I'm going to make it up this mountain. And we can't say that about ourselves or anyone else. So we cling to the God who saved us from our sins and has promised us life in abundance. Like the hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless I look to thee for grace. This is possible for you if you want it. Believe in his message and ask him for grace and he freely gives. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you are God. Thank you, Lord, that you continue to remind us of your sovereignty and your power and our finitude. That we may not raise our hearts high, that we may be reminded that we are creatures. Lord, we thank you for your son who is our sacrifice. That although we have been rebellious, that you consider us your children and that you take care of us, that you will lead us home. And Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit, you can give us the wisdom and strength to turn to you and to cling to your cross, that we may quiet and calm our souls in these anxious and troubling times, that we may see your purposes and your glory, that we can say that the Lord is truly good and faithful in our lives. Guide us, O Lord. Guide us with wisdom. Guide those who are in charge of the situation, the government authorities, and the healthcare professionals with your wisdom and resources, because you are king, and our hope is ultimately in you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.